First Timothy chapter two. I knew I would get here sooner or later when you're doing verse by verse. You can skip over verses. You can skip over sections that may cause some difficulty, but that's not normally the way I, I seek to approach the Scriptures. If there is something that I don't understand, if I don't have enough light to be able to speak on it, I'll be honest about that. And there have been times where I have dealt with a passage of Scripture at one point in my life with whatever limited knowledge, light that I had on that passage and then come back later on and have more light and be able to preach it more fully. And this is one of those passages of scriptures that has definitely, well, there's a firestorm around these verses in our generation. And some individuals who are uh, quotable, readable, Men, and I'm not going to name names, uh, would take a very different position than what I am taking as I approach these scriptures. But I don't think, as I was just speaking, speaking to someone Friday night, I believe it was, I don't believe that you can go back 50 years ago and before and find anyone in the history of the church in the sense of those who are who we would relate to historically that would teach this passage the way some are teaching it now in our generation that call themselves evangelicals and who and who and with whom we would agree in areas of soteriology but they are interpreting this passage very differently and I'm concerned about that. And I'm going to not race through these verses. We'll take probably two weeks to deal with these verses. But I want us to, I want us to hear from God. And I want us to submit ourselves to God in what He says. Last week we dealt with verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And now, in verse 9, he turns to women. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but, it's a strong word there, but, which becomes women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but, it's a strong word again there, but, to be in silence. Every time you see B-U-T in the text, it doesn't necessarily mean this strong uh, comparison that's being drawn or a strong difference. In here, in these verses, you have two of those words, Greek words, translated but. It's in verse 10 and it's at the end of verse 12. But, to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So why is Paul writing these gender-specific instructions to a New Testament church? And why do we need to give thought to these things 2,000 years later? Does it really matter who prays when, so long as they're praying? Does it really matter who teaches when, as long as what they're teaching is correct? Does it really even matter? 
And if people are benefiting, isn't that really the most significant thing? And so if a, a woman is leading and praying and teaching and people are benefiting, isn't that really what matters? Isn't really what matters the result? Isn't that really, really what matters? As long as people are getting something, as long as people are growing, as long as people are being affected in some positive way, shouldn't that really be the barometer of what is right and what is wrong, what is orderly and what is not? Can't we just talk about Jesus and not get bogged down with the details of order in the church? I mean, you've come to church today and you want to hear a message about your Savior, right? You want to hear Jesus Christ exalted. You want to hear a gospel message. We pray for the impact of the gospel. And here the preacher tells you to turn to 1 Timothy 2 and we read about men, women, and order in the church. It's like, oh, please. Really? How is preaching on this subject going to help us in the 21st century? I mean, this is archaic stuff. I mean, you, you can get a newer translation and say something besides shamefacedness, broided hair, costly array. Address the language up, but it still says the same thing. And silence and subjection. Cindy Walker said last night, yeah, I heard you're, you're preaching on women Sunday. I don't know where she heard that from. Was that my wife? I don't know. Okay, my wife. And uh, preaching on women Sunday. Yeah, I'm going to tell them to shut up. That's the way some people read this. Either, either men who are preaching it or women who are hearing it. And we've, We've grown way beyond that. I mean, men and women can pretty much do what they want to do, just as long as we have Jesus stamped on our card or tattooed, or we profess His name. That's really what matters, isn't it? As with every other institution in God's world, there is order that He has established, the word cosmos. It's found in our text. And when His order is ignored, and ever since Adam and Eve sinned, the order of God has been ignored in this world. And when His order is ignored, the results cannot be good. No matter how they may appear, in a moment of time or even a season of time, ultimately... It's going to go bad when His order is ignored. It doesn't matter the diagnosis of human minds. It doesn't matter what you or I think or others think or what the culture thinks. When we ignore the order of God, it cannot ultimately be good. And to the degree that the church ignores God's order, to that degree we lose our effectiveness as Christ's representation in this world. We may be representing what we call Jesus or a religious system we call Christian, but if we're not, we're not following the order that God has established, we're not representing Him properly in this world. And we are weakened. The church is weakened. And the church may be many things, but it is not the power of God in this world. If we are not so focused upon Jesus Christ that we're willing to say, Lord, what would you have me to do? What would you have us to do? How would you have us to live? How would you have us to order things? Some people will say, well, we just move according to the Spirit. Well, what Spirit is that? You know, there are... There are other spirits in the world. And so we must base our movement guided by the Spirit upon the Word of God. You can't separate the Spirit from the Word and call it the Spirit of God. God. 
So what Paul instructs in this passage before us is important. And I don't want to make more of it than what should be made. But I don't want to make less of it than what should be made either. So I'm aiming for the bullseye. I don't know if I'll hit it. I've asked God to help. You have the Scriptures before you. So you can work through this with me. And I trust the Spirit of God will guide us. This Scripture, it's not the only one, but this Scripture has to do with establishing the effect of the gospel, establishing the effect of the gospel in resetting the cosmos. That sin has disoriented. Sin messed up the cosmos, the order of God. And Christ came to establish order in the world. The law was given to help to establish the order, but the law didn't succeed. Christ has come in order to change the hearts of men and women and to bring them together to live out the order that God has established from the beginning. You noticed in this passage, Paul goes back to the beginning to talk about the order that he's fleshing out in the church in the New Testament church. I think it's helpful to proper interpretation of this passage to keep a few thoughts in mind as before we actually get into the verses. I don't know how far we're going to get today, but I'm not, I'm not rushing to get through. By the grace of God, we'll have next week, and if we don't, we're going to get what God wants us to get today, and then we'll, we'll wait for more the next time He brings us together. Instructions here in this passage are specifically directed to the context of a church gathering. I, I tried to establish that the last time we were in this passage. The word pray in verse 8 is the word Greek word that is only used of worshipful prayer. There are other words translated prayer or prayer or expressions of prayer that are also used in relationship to others, to a human relationship. But this word, Greek word for pray, is only used in reference to God. Communicating God. So we, we see it as a word that's associated with worship, which is the primary purpose of gathering together. Prayer is a primary purpose of our gathering. Prayer, singing, preaching, those are elements of our coming together as the people of God. And then you have in chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, these things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. So he's talking about, talking about behavior in the house of God. Well, it doesn't matter how I behave as long as my heart is right. No, it matters how you behave. Behavior is important. In fact, behavior is a reflection of your heart. Behavior is important. Which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of, of the truth. Which indicates to us that Paul is dress, addressing behavior in church when we come together. And don't, don't, don't get, don't get moved away from that con, that New Testament concept that the church does consist of gathering together. When you come together in the church, Paul writes in Corinthians, in the church, not a church building, but in the, in the gathering, when the church comes together, there's something that happens. There's an order that is at work that's different from other gatherings, other assemblies that take place in the world. The other thing to keep in mind and the reason I say that is because everything that's said here does not apply to every situation in the world. And so that's important to keep in mind. Though there's some general principles here that can apply to every situation in the world. Uh, there's different dress and there's different, uh, different expressions uh, that will happen in your home or in a leisure setting or in a work setting or et cetera, et cetera. And so this is applying to when you come together primarily. Secondly, instructions here are gender specific. 
They are gender, gender specific, but be careful. The issue here is not value in Christ. It's not, now men are more valuable than women, so women, just own up to it, and here's what we have to say to you. That's not the point here. In Christ, there is no difference. We see that in Galatians 3, verse 28. There's no difference. And yet there is a distinction, just like there is between Jew and Gentile, you know, bond and free, the others that are mentioned in Galatians 3, 28, male, female. There is a distinction. We don't blur the line and say, there is, well, there's no, there's no distinction. There's, a, there's no difference, though, in reference to who we are in Christ. That's the point of Galatians 3. God values you, sister in Christ. He values, values you as much as He values a brother in Christ. And yet there are roles established by God from the beginning of creation that are worked out in the church. Men are to lead. They're to lead in prayer. They're to lead in teaching, as we'll continue to see in our text. Women are to support, and they are to be led. Women are to be led. And Paul emphasizes here good works with a spirit of submission in relationship to women. We'll talk about that. But I'm just giving you an overview here. This, these are gender... All through this passage, it's gender specific. And there isn't just an establishing of a husband-wife relationship. That's one of the arguments that you, that's used by... Some of the modern commentators and people who want to blur the lines and say women can do whatever men can do. That he's talking about. Because the same word that's translated woman can be translated wife. And the word translated man can be translated husband. And we understand that. But it's clear from verse 8 down through the end that he has not just a woman as a wife or a man as a husband, but the genders themselves Man and woman, that's the comparison that's being made here, established in the beginning. Another point is this, that instructions here are aimed at the heart. Externals are never the main issue. Externals are not excluded from this passage, but ultimately the aim is deeper than that. Men lifting up holy hands. It's not the idea of lifting up, literally lifting up your hands. It is a heart issue. Holy hands. We talked about that. It's an issue of the heart. Women. Notice the words that are used in this passage. Women with shamefacedness, facedness, shamefastness, sobriety, subjection, godliness, faith, charity, Holiness. Those are the words that are used in this passage. Those are heart-level words being used. So the issue isn't just outward conformity to a standard or a set of rules. It's doing what Paul says do from a heart that is in line, that is in submission to God, and then to the order that He has established. And so I'm saying to you, in, this inter, in these introductory thoughts, it matters to God how and why we do what we do as His people in the context of the church. It, it does matter to God. Think about this. The church is not the world. These are not instructions to the world. We don't preach these things to the world. This is not to the world. It's to the church. It's to the saints of God. The world is not the trendsetter for the church. We're not looking at the world. We're not seeing how the wind's blowing and then order things in the church. We're not asking the world, what do you want? And then as a church, establishing order according to what will fit the world. You understand? I'm, and, I, and I know I'm saying things that to you and I, most of you anyway, probably you're thinking, well, preacher, we know that already. But I'm telling you, we live in a generation that doesn't know that. A church generation that doesn't seem to know that. And the church exists in multiple cultures around the world. What we see here are principles. Yes, Paul is writing in a culture. 
an Ephesian culture. When he writes to the Corinthians, it's a Corinthian culture. And we don't exclude that thought that he's writing in the context of a culture. And so that helps us in maybe understanding some of the things that he is saying. Nevertheless, there are principles that transcend culture. And that's the point that we need to get. And so no matter where the church is established, there are principles of behavior and godliness in the church that are to be applied. No matter where it is, Siberia, Africa, South America, as I prayed through continents this morning in my in my prayer time, just asking God's blessing on the world. I'm thinking of these. And, and you know, if, if you're isolated, if you're like the Paul Washer talks about this tribe in Brazil, in the mountains of Brazil, or Peru, I'm sorry, per, Peru. And uh, he came to the scripture that says, go into all the world. And in their minds, all the world was what was over the next mountain. And so they said, let's go. You know, and they had no clue of the vastness of the world. No clue. Didn't even, didn't even compute in their minds that there was anything like this in the world. You see, there's cultures like that. There's cultures that still are like that in places in the world. Does the gospel fit there? Does this order fit there? When Trevor and Paul and those in Papua are are establishing churches there in that region, can they establish those churches according to the order here? And remember, in that particular culture, women are less valuable than pigs. Uh, women are nothing. Women are put down. The, and there could be there can be this danger, this dangerous possibility of women once they are liberated in Christ, actually coming out from under that oppression, that ungodly oppression, and going further than what they should. And that, some say, may have been what was going on here in Ephesus. And so Paul is saying, no, wait a minute. God has an order. It isn't what you grew up under. It isn't that oppression that in the culture that you have lived under. But it also isn't just whatever you want. It isn't women becoming men and men becoming women. It's there are roles, gender specific roles, and it matters to God how we work that out. And so contrary to Greek and Jewish culture of Paul's day, Paul expected that women would join the men in the church assembly. You know, we read that and we think, I don't know, you know, was there ever a time where Paul had to say that? Yeah, there was a time. Where that had to be said. Women were not welcome. Uh, Jew, Jewish rabbi, there were some Jewish rabbis that would not teach a woman. In the Greek culture, women were not supposed to be seen. They were supposed to, be, they were supposed to stay in their own home. They were not to be seen out in public. A very, a very oppressive kind of culture for women. But if you grow up in that, that's all you ever know. I suppose you get used to it. But Paul is writing in the context of that kind of culture. And so while they were not to be leaders in the assembly, they had their place of service, and Paul is writing about that. And Paul's instructions were not intended to suppress women. It feels that way in our culture because our culture has gone beyond the order of God. But these are guidelines for followers of Christ to live out godliness in the company of Believing men and women. I might just throw this note out that here's an example of what I mean when people want to say that Paul is just being oppressive to women here. You understand Paul recognized the significance of women in ministry. Very much so. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3, he says, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel. His idea wasn't women were to be in some sort of you know, back room somewhere and have no part in the laboring in the gospel. He recognized it. With Clement also, with other my yoke fellow, uh, fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. You go to Romans chapter 16, I'm not going there, but you read through the list of names, you'll find women's names listed there. She writes, she says, greet this person, greet that person. And a number of those names are women's names. 
He wasn't afraid of women. He wasn't, women didn't intimidate him. He didn't feel the need to put them down so they didn't take over his position. None of that was going on. He seemed to have respect for women and love women and wanted to show women as well as men what God expected, what the proper order was, and how to work that out in the context of life and in the church. And so in the context of the church gathering, gathering women by their appearance, by their attitude, and by their action, are to complement and support the men who lead. And by the way, all men aren't leaders in the church. And that, that's a whole other message. But when we speak of men leading, all, all men are leaders in their home. If you're, if you're what you should be, you're to be leading. But all men aren't the leaders in the church. Although there is an aspect of leadership that I think every man should take, even in the context of the church. But women are to complement and support the leadership of men. And we can say that whether we're talking about life in the home or life in the church. And so in verse 9, Paul says, in like manner also, which connects what follows with verse 8, I will therefore, I will therefore, in fact, there's no verb there in verse 9, I in like manner also. And so you go back to verse 8, and it's, I will therefore. And so Paul is expressing his will. He's expressing, this. Is, these are instructions that he has given. There's apostolic authority here. I will therefore. Now some believe that he, he's actually connecting also with pray. I will therefore that women pray. He doesn't say that specifically. And so that's, there's sort of a question mark there. We know that women can be in the company of men when they pray. And some read Acts chapter 1, verses is it 14 and 15 or 13 and 14, where it lists women who were with the apostles and with the men. And it says they were with one accord in prayer. And some conclude that women were praying. Well, one thing I can conclude from that is that women were with one accord with the men in praying. That doesn't mean they were verbalizing it, but we do know that they were entering in. They were with the men. And that's what Paul is getting at here. Men and women are together in the church, but men are leading. And women are, are, are supposed to be coming along and, and following and participating and serving in the role that God has intended for you as a woman. In like manner, Paul says, we must apply the truths that Paul gives here in the context of 21st century Western culture. We're not in that culture. It is different today. So we have to apply it in the culture in which we live. But we must not allow our culture to control our interpretation and application. And frankly, brethren, that is very difficult. It's very difficult. And I admit that right out of the gate. But I want to try to be faithful to God in His Word and the things that I say. And there are extremes. You know, I'm giving all these caveats here, but... You know, but the, but there there are extremes, the positions that people take there that that are that go beyond the scripture, and we need to be careful that we don't do that. But we need to be careful that we do not allow the culture to dictate what goes on in the church of Jesus Christ. You note that Paul is specifically addressing verse ten: women professing godliness. That's who he's got in view here as he's speaking. Women professing godliness. Is that you? If that's you, you're being addressed. The world at large is not in view. Unbelievers are not in view. Unregenerate are not in view. What he says here is for women who profess to be worshipers of God. The word godliness there is... Not the same word that's translated in other places, godliness, but the idea is you make a name, you proclaim, you witness, you testify that you are a worshiper of God. And you gather in the assembly of the saints. There are expectations of you that are different from the rest of the world. You're not just a woman of the world. You're not a woman within 
the world of women. You're separated. You've been called out. There's something different about you. By the way, not only when you assemble for corporate worship, but here especially, we're thinking about that as we come together with the men in the church, as we assemble together. You're not to look, think, act like the world. There's something different about you. Or at least there should be, and that's what Paul is arguing. There should be proper appearance. The three main categories I'm looking at, we won't get to it all today, but is the proper appearance, the proper attitude, and proper actions in this text through verse 12. A proper appearance. Proper appearance. Does God really care what you wear? Have you asked the question that way? Does God really care what you wear? Answer, yes. Now, you ought not be so concerned about what I think you ought to wear. You need to be concerned about what God says about the matter. There's one lawgiver. It ain't me. Nor any other man or woman who's written a book on the subject. God is the lawgiver. There are two words used here. One is, uh, it's, it's, they're a little bit different in the Greek, but they come from the same root. In like manner that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Adorn and modest. And this is the King James translation. I know that some of the modern translations use modest where the King James says shamefacedness. With shamefacedness, shamefacedness they insert modest, but that, that's, that's not the, it's not the same word. Okay? I'm looking at, Modest apparel and adorning. Adorning, it's the idea of orderly arrangement. Modest apparel, orderly arranged apparel. That's the root of the word. It's the root cosmos. Your clothing, your dress is orderly arranged. Paul is not calling for women to ignore their appearance. He's not saying it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter how you dress. By the way, though the emphasis here seems to be upon those who were dressing in a gaudy sort of fashion, sort of flaunting their wealth, the other, it can go the other way as well. Flaunt your poverty or, or an attitude of, I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm going to be disheveled and I'm going to be, I'm going to be unkempt. I'm going to be dowdy. It doesn't matter. I'll do what I want to do. That's not the idea here. In fact, he says, he says, that women adorn themselves. And so, sisters, you need to be thinking about your dress. Endorn the... Men shouldn't be telling you what you should wear. You should be thinking about this. Adorn themselves. Clothe yourself. Arrange yourself. This is something that needs to come from within you. Paul obviously wants women to think about this, to be concerned about this. It's not an insignificant matter. So he is, he is, he's certainly not saying it. Don't worry about your appearance. Look as ugly as you can. Look as unkempt as you can. But he is also not, he is saying, don't be ostentatious. Don't be showy. Don't be attention grabbing in your appearance. That's the idea. Whether it's, Overdressing, underdressing. In other words, just think of your appearance. And it doesn't just have to do with your dress. It has to do with other things. Your hair. He talks about broided hair and gold and pearls. And costly array, the dress. Orderly. Simplistic and chaste. Maybe that's a good way to summarize it. Orderly. Simplistic and chaste. Now remember, these are the guiding principles for coming together with the saints. I mean, some of the young ladies here, you're going to have a day maybe uh, when some young man wants to ask you to marry them. And you're going to remember this message the preacher preached. You're going to say, man, I can't even dress up, can't fix my hair, I can't, I can't, you know. That's not what this is talking about. 
The fact of the matter is the spotlight is on the bride in a situation like that. And you are to dress up. The Scriptures even speak of it that way. Isaiah 61.10 talks about the jewels that we're adorned with. That comes from that idea of marriage and a, a, a bride dressing up for the occasion. Well, what's this occasion? This ca- occasion isn't about a focus on you or focus on me. It's focus on our God coming together in, in prayer and worship. It's not about the individual. And so he points out broided hair, or gold or pearls, broided hair. I don't know exactly what that is. Uh, braided hair, the word's a little difficult. Uh, the Greek word doesn't really help a whole lot, but it's somehow they knotted, they spent a lot of time knotting the hair and putting it in certain, a certain kind of decoration. And, and I understand that they even inserted gold into the, the, the knots in the hair, the, the braids, if we want to call it that. Uh, pearls, they just decked themselves out so that when they came in, it was, whoa. Wow. And so, you know, the women gather over in a corner, and how long did you, how much did that cost? And how, how long did it take you to do that? How long will it last? Your husband was okay with that? And you, you know, and all of a sudden you came to, to the house for worship and prayer, and you done been, you've thrown it all out of sorts. The attention is on you, and then, of course, you don't sit in the back corner, you sit up front. So all during the prayer and singing the message, people are having to, you know, the glitter of the, you know. The point is, it's attention getting. That's, that's the idea. Look over at 1 Peter chapter 3, the kindred scripture, though I think here in 1 Peter, he's not talking about the gathering of the assembly. He's talking about his life. In general, women relating to, to, to their husbands here, wives and husbands. And he says in this context, in verse 3, who's adorning? There's that word for cosmos, orderly arrangement. Let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. And he's not saying don't put on clothes. That's not the point, though that's what it says. That's not the point. The point is, don't put it on for the purpose of that being what you are wanting people to see and notice. Modest apparel. In like manner that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Primarily, he's speaking of well-ordered, simple, fitting dress of a godly woman. This is clothing that covers. Clothing that does not accentuate one's form. Again, we're living in a generation where, I mean, you know, if if, it seems like you can almost be happy if people just aren't showing flesh. But you realize you can cover and leave nothing uncovered. Do you all know what I mean by that? It is so tight... That everything is revealed. You're a woman. Paul, nor is God saying, don't take your womanliness into, and uh, don't remove that desire to present yourself as a, a woman out of the equation. You are a woman and you're to dress as a woman. That's another point, not as a man, but as a woman. And, and it, there should be femininity about it. But you don't have to reveal everything in your... The pur- purpose of clothing, and I didn't want this message to be all about this, but the purpose of clothing is to cover, not to reveal. Sometimes when people come into church, and it happens even here, I can tell you as a man... I have to check my eyes. I mean, partly because I don't want to feel embarrassed that I was looking at something I shouldn't have looked at. It's not because I'm, you know, gravitating in my mind toward in some sort of sexual way, but that can happen. Am I being too explicit here? Women, you know you are gathering with men. 
You're in a world with men. And men think a certain way. They don't think like you do. And you can attract the attention of a man in a way that you may not intend to. I'm not, I have not concluded that every woman who dresses with tight clothing is trying to attract the attention of a, of a man. I don't go there with my judgments. But that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And so I'm not saying you're intending to do it. But I'm saying you should think about that. Especially when you come to the assembly. But at any time, really. But when you come to the assembly, you need to look at yourself and maybe if you're married, ask your husband. If you're not, ask your father. And if not, ask somebody you respect. Is this too tight? Is this too revealing? Am I attracting? And men, don't, don't cop out. You know, I'm afraid to, afraid to say anything because she's going to get ticked if I say anything. No, but love your wife. Love your daughters. Let them know, you know, do you really, you, you want your, and don't take this attitude, well, you know, men need to just get a grip on their thinking. Absolutely, that's true. But, 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 sisters, women, you, you have a responsibility. And when we come together in this place, there shouldn't be distractions going on because of the opulent dressing or the dressing that is alluring attention in an improper way to your body that should be covered. You don't want to be a distraction for men with whom you're gathering for prayer and worship. Now these principles of appearance apply in all of life, but especially here. The church was never intended to be a place to flaunt fashion. And that's historic, at least in my generation, my lifetime, that's been often what it is. I don't think so much here. I haven't seen it so much here, but historically and out there in the church in general. But then it's almost gone to another extreme where people come to church, women come to church with, you know, jeans and, and you know, printing all over their shirts. And, and it's kind of almost gone to the other extreme where it doesn't matter. Ripped jeans. That's kind of that's kind of the other extreme. It's, it's attention grabbing. And, and I'm not saying you're doing it for that. I'm just saying, I'm just telling you what happens. And, and so as a man, I'm having to process something. If I don't just ignore you, I'm having to you're you're forcing a man to have to do something in his mind. Where, where he didn't come to church with any thought of anything like that. And then when you come in with tight fitting clothing, revealing or unkempt, or I suppose the list could go on. You're forcing, there's a sense in which you're forcing others to engage in their mind in ways that it really, we have to engage in that already out there in the world, don't we? Men, is it true? I don't. Now you, yeah, you do. Yeah, it's out there, everywhere, billboards, everywhere. You can't hardly do it. You can't go to the grocery uh, grocery line. I haven't been in a grocery store in a while, but you know, you can't hardly go through a grocery line. Last I looked, anyway, they had some ridiculous magazines out. It's everywhere, even if it's not in the on the women themselves. Well, much more can be said about this. But, sister, just in case you think God doesn't care, would you take time to read Proverbs chapter 7, which talks about the attire of an harlot and warns you against it? By your very dress. And there, not only the dress, it's the words, it's the way you carry yourself. It says you can actually be guilty of forcing a man. Interesting language there. God doesn't hold you guiltless in regards to the way you present yourself. And I don't want to get too far off track here from the passage. I don't think that's necessarily the main point of this passage, but it's certainly here in these words. There's got to be a proper appearance. Did you give thought to that this morning, sisters, when you... We're getting ready to come together to worship.
Did you even think about that? Your appearance. And then he says, the attitude. He says, with shamefacedness and sobriety. You see, I'm not pressing a dress code. I won't press a dress code. But I will press dress that reveals a godly attitude. And that's the point here. Does what you wear represent your heart? And if it does, then I've got some concerns for some. Because of what you're revealing, what you're saying through your dress. But you ought to have such a dress that reveals that something is going on inside of you that would keep you from dressing in an immodest fashion. Immodest meaning out of order, whether it be, whether it be in relationship to gaudiness or whether it be in relationship to a more of a, a framing your body for seductive or attention-getting ways. Shamefacedness, he says. That's a word, in fact, it's interesting point that in the 1611 King James, the word was shamefastness. There are people that will actually say somebody corrupted, I mean, (laughs) corrupted that English by saying shamefacedness. Because shamefastness has the idea, it gets to the heart of the word, which carries with it the idea of shame. In fact, there's the idea of the eyes looking down. You can kind of sense the the picture here is that this is a person whose heart is such that they're not wanting to proper improperly uh, uh, draw attention to themselves, and they they it, uh, it it's almost like a sense of horror to think that they would be guilty of actually causing a problem for anyone else. Shame, facedness, a spirit that is fearful of doing a shameful thing, attracting attention, distracting from our primary purpose for gathering. The the, the word here is used one other time in the New Testament. It's in Hebrews 12 and verse 28, and it's translated there, reverence. It's translated there in the King James as well as the ESV. Reverence. Interesting. With reverence, with shamefacedness. There's something going on inside of you that affects the way that you present yourself, your appearance. You're thinking beyond yourself. You're thinking of the effect upon others. So this is contrary to a careless, flaunting spirit that gives no serious consideration to one's appearance. I'll dress however I please kind of mindset. It's dress that fits this spirit that will be fitting dress, that will be adorning, modest dress. Not dress that's screaming, look at me! but rather appearing in a way that shows respect for the purpose of our gathering, worship, without distraction. The other word he uses is sobriety. Soundness of mind. So something's going on inside of you in relationship to your appearance. You're not wanting to be a distraction. And you're thinking about this. You're not looking to outside of the world, you're serious, you're self-controlled, you're not listening to the promptings of your flesh. You're not controlled by the latest fashions. You're not motivated in your dress or your appearance by impulses or peer pressure. But a spirit controlled by a desire for godliness. After all, he is saying in verse 10, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. And this should be very evident in the gathering of the saints. If it's evident nowhere else, it it ought to be evident here. And when people come in, you know, I hear people say, well, you know, if we dress, you know, the way, you know, probably we should, then people come in off the streets wherever, they're going to be uncomfortable around us. So we want to dress like they do. You know, all things to all men. That is so wrong. 
No, our desire is to be an influence on them. To have an effect upon them. But you see, here's what's going to happen. You notice what he says. Well, let me, let me, let me come back to that thought. First Peter 3, 4, let me run over here because this is so fitting. Here's the emphasis. But let it, first Peter 3, 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. That's the point. This sobriety, shamefacedness, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. That's, that's where this is, that's where this is so important. It's what's inside of you. That's what's, that's what's so great a price in the sight of God. Listen, I, whether I approve of, of this or not, it's God. It, this is the, this is what God says is valuable. Is that this kind of spirit, this meek and quiet, this gentle spirit be going on inside of you, revealed in the way that you appear, the way that you present yourself? Then in verse 10, it's going to be manifested in your works, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. But here's the, here's the opposite. It's good works. It's not, it's not the show of the external. It's how you act. It's how you, you carry yourself. It's proper action that Paul now says is important. And let's take one point here and we'll close. In verse 10, he emphasizes good works. This is to char characterize or adorn women who are professing godliness, who are worshipers of God. So go back to the idea of someone coming in off the street, tattooed up, short skirt or low blouse or whatever, tight, skin tight stuff. You don't want them coming in and saying, hey, they're one of, I, you know, I fit here. But what they ought to feel is, those people didn't judge me. Are they... Good works. Ladies, I'm talking to you. Men, we're not the ones that need to go be putting our arms around those, those women. We're not the ones, you know, sitting down having a conversation with that low blouse. You know what I'm saying? That's, men, that's not our place. I'm not, I'm not trying to be legalistic here. It's just that primarily women professing godliness, you come along. You sit with those and you're dressed in, in modest apparel, orderly fashion. Your hair is done nicely, but not extravagant. Your, your face is washed, and if you need some makeup, put it on. Whatever, you know, I'm not saying... He's not ruling those things out. But what they're seeing in you is a woman that's demonstrating works. Good works. What are those? Well, it's a broad term, but look at chapter 5. Here's an example. Well reported of for good works. This is the widow that's a widow indeed. If she have brought up children. Good works. You're a woman that loves your children. They're not a burden to you. And you don't, you don't manifest that it's a burden to you to have these children. You, you, you brought them up or you're bringing them up. That's a good work. Did you hear me? That's a good work. If she have lodged strangers, wash the saints' feet. Do you, do you hear this? These are ministries uh, that are, that, that women are supposed to give themselves to, caring for others. If she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work, I, I, I think as far as men, it's not that we're to be excluded from these kinds of works, but we ought to look at the women and say, I am so impressed by what they're doing. I'm so impressed by the good works we see in the godly women in the assembly. And, and when those, as I've mentioned, that come in from the outside, they ought to see it, they ought to feel it, and they ought to feel, on one level, they ought to feel welcomed. On another level, they ought to feel uncomfortable. To find that balance sometimes is not easy. You remember the woman in Peter's life 
uh, that her name was Dorcas. Do you remember the, the description? She was the woman that had died, and he, 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 she was raised alive. Do you know what the description of her was? She was full of good works and maybe faith. Good works and something else. Full of good works. And they actually gathered around. They talked about it. They said, yeah, she made this for me. And she, well, she made this for me. Full of good works. Now, is that the only good work? I mean, do you have to be a seamstress? Do you have to be a quilt maker? Do you have to be a, you know, a, a, the great baker? Uh, no, there, there's multiple good works. This, this isn't the idea, isn't here to make a list and force everybody into the same mold. But it is to say that good works include all the works that fit the life of a woman who professes godliness. That ought to be what stands out about about you, if you're a woman professing godliness. You're not doing what you do so that people will talk about you and say how godly you are. You're doing it because it's coming from inside of you. Shame faced the supplies here too. It's not doing these works to be seen of men. That's a Pharisee. That's not shame faced. But it's doing it because in your heart, you're a godly woman and you want that which pleases God. And you see the role that He has placed you in and you want to give yourself to it. Actions that please God. And so while there is diversity of works, not one size fits all, how you live, sister in Christ, how you live your life and how you interact with others to the glory of God is more and more significant than what you look like. More significant than your appearance. Not that the appearance is not an issue. But it's the works. In other words, wear the gospel. How about that? Wear the gospel. Adorn yourself with the gospel. And I do not mean tattoos, and I do not, do not mean shirts with Bible verses on it. I'm talking about good works. And Paul will continue. And we'll continue here, Lord willing, next week. I've avoided the most controversial stuff this morning. But she is to learn in silence. She is not to teach. She is to be in subjection, all subjection, it says. And we're going to look at what that means and how that works out in our lives. In a generation that has all but thrown out order, that has been established by God, this teaching and what we're going to look at next week really seems archaic at best and extremely offensive to a world in fundamental rebellion against God. And we need to recognize that. Young people, I'm, I need to say something to you because you're growing up in a world that's worse than when I was growing up. And the pressure is on you. Oh, the pressure. It's on you in the churches. Uh, that's why some people want to go find another church. You need to find another church that I can feel comfortable in my apparel. I don't have to be concerned about thinking about that. Why wouldn't you want to think about that if you're a godly woman? If you're a woman professing godliness? I don't want to go to... I mean, women can't even get up in the pulpit. I was speaking to somebody in the last couple of days and in their church. The pastor sits on the side and a woman comes up and for 20 minutes or so, leads the congregation and teaches them. And then, and then another woman comes up and closes out what that woman was doing and appealing, calling, exhorting the church to get their act together. And then the pastor comes up and preaches, and supposedly that's not transgressing our text. I'm just saying... That's the culture that we're growing up in. And it's in the church. Church as so-called. And so we need to be careful that we're not drawn away. I trust that your heart will not be drawn away. God has a order. It's a perfect order. You can trust Him. You can trust Him. You really can trust Him. 
no matter what the world says, no matter what the religious or church groups, even those that you think are like us, stick to the Word of God, okay? It's what God says. And as a teacher in this church, I want to say that I am greatly encouraged by the way of the appearance and the attitude and the actions that reveal women professing godliness. I don't think we're perfect. I think there's areas where we have fallen short. And, and if you are one of those and you, it's a, you are, you're feeling identified, you're feeling like, well, he's talking to me, come talk to me and ask me. I would prefer you talk to the Lord about it. I would prefer that your own heart be worked upon in such a way that you see the truth and you begin to follow it with an humble, submissive spirit manifesting the mind of Christ within the assembly. Well, amen. That's all I have.